copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 204 regarding a fight at Grand and Jefferson. See the man and keep the peace. Rosenquist. Thank you, Mr. Blackmore. You're looking swell. Nobody'd ever think you just had a baby. Young Mr. Blackmore is just three days old today. Three days. Seems like you've been in here three years. Can you miss me? I'll say. A lot. The doctor says I can go home next week. I want you to stay as long as the doctor says for you to. No getting up and running around like you did before. Oh, I'm all right, darling. We're strong women, we Blackmores. That's a healthy-looking son you've got in the nursery out there. Mm, have you seen him today? Sure. That is, as much as they'd let me. Gosh, you'd think babies were poison, the way these nurses herd you around. It's you who's poison to the babies. Oh, I won't hurt him. Why can't I just hold him? Doctor's orders. Ah, oh, gee. Gosh, that's half the fun, playing with them. You'll have plenty of time for that when we get home. You'll probably have your hands full with two youngsters and a wife to take care of. I couldn't ask for anything better. Oh, darling. You'd better run along now. It's almost feeding time, and the nurse will throw you out. I'd like to see her try it. Now, now you go on. Get out of here before you're thrown out. All right. I'll be back tomorrow, just as soon as I get off work. All right, darling. Goodbye. <laughs> Christy Blackmore never came back. Next morning, the 27th of October, the bleak dawn found him standing on the street corner, waiting for the car that would take him to work. An automobile pulled to a stop. Give you a lift, Betty? Why, uh, yeah, thanks. A little chilly this morning. 
plenty cold, if you ask me. Where do you work? Over across town. I only transfer on Grant. Well, I go straight through. I'll drop you at Grand and Jefferson. How's that? That'll be fine. Hey, what are you doing? What are you talking to? Coming to you, you dumb fuck. You almost went into it back there. That's to you. I ain't been near you. Oh, yeah. Just stop that car for you, and I'll get there, you. God, beat it. Listen, Mutt. I'll knock your teeth on your crooked head hard with me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Hey, that guy sounds like a foghorn. Who does he think he is, anyway? Oh, some punch drunk pug, I guess, from the looks of him. They're still following you. Let him follow. I don't care. Well... You can let me out at the next corner. Okay. Hope you get to work on time. Oh, thanks. I've got lots of time. It isn't far from here. I'll let you out before the light changes. Okay. Thanks a lot for the lift. Don't mention it. Be seeing you. Hey, Izzy, put on your sweat your brakes. I see that bozo what was in that other car. I'm going to take care of him. Come on, Twitch. All right, wise guy. Here's how we handle mugs like you. Take it, Twitch. Yeah, that'll hold him for a while. Let's win, Three days later, Christy Blackmore dies from the injuries received at the hands of his brutal attackers. Detectives Con Daffer and Hickey begin the hopeless task of rounding up witnesses to the assault. And then, at the coroner's inquest... You have viewed the body? I have. And you recognize the man? He was my brother, Christy Blackmore. Do you know how he met his death? No, I don't. Was he married? Yes. Any children? Two. A boy two years old and another just six days old. That'll be all, Mr. Blackmore. Sonny Edwards. Yes, sir. Where were you on the morning of October 27th when this fight occurred? Uh, I was on the southeast corner of Jefferson at Grand. I was crossing the street when I saw the car stop. What were you doing on that corner at that hour of the morning? Oh, well, I'd looked to see if any money had been left, and then I counted my papers. Oh, you sell papers there? Uh, yes, sir. I have a rack there. Well, as I said, I, uh, I saw this car drive up. It was a Hudson, I think. And these three men got out, and... One of them said something. I don't know what it was, but the other two, they didn't say a word. They just went over, and I saw him hit that man, Mr. Blackmore, and then he fell down. What did the men do then? Well, they got back in the car, and one of the men said, let's scram, and the car drove off. Did all the men get out of the car? Uh, no, sir. No, no. The driver, he stayed in the automobile. Would you be able to recognize these men? Uh, no, sir. I, I don't think so. That's all. Uh, Thomas Britton. Yes, sir. Were you present at the time this attack is alleged to have occurred on the morning of October 27th? Yes, sir. What were you, where were you in relation to the deceased? I was about 20 feet away at the time. Did you see him get out of the automobile? Yes, sir. I saw that gentleman over there, Mr. Kearns, drive up and let the other man out of the car. And then Mr. Kearns drove off, and the other man stood there maybe for oh, half a minute. Then this other car, the Hudson, drove up and stopped about six feet away from the curb and down a ways from where the other man, Mr. Blackmore, was standing. Three men got out and came up to Mr. Blackmore, and one of them struck him in the face. And I heard him say, Take him, Turk. And the other two men began hitting him. What did this first man look like? Well, I, I couldn't get a good look at him, but he was short. Looked something like a prize fighter. You say there were two others? Yes, sir. One was a tall fellow, and the other one was short. Heavy set man. Was he the one called the Turk? Yes, sir. Did you see a fourth man? A man who stayed in the car. Well, I, I saw that there was a man in the car, but but I didn't get a good look at him. Would you be able to identify any of the men you saw that morning? I don't know. I, I might be able to. Thank you, Mr. Britton. Uh, Joseph Kern. Yes, sir. Uh, you drove the deceased in your automobile to Jefferson and Grand on the morning of October 27th? Yes, sir. Were you in the habit of doing that? No, sir. I'd never seen him before that morning. How far did he ride with you? From the time I picked him up and until we got to Jefferson and Grand. Did anything unusual happen during that time? Well, I had a dispute with a fellow about the right-of-way, but I didn't pay much attention to it. Did Mr. Blackmore have any words with these men? No, sir. He never said anything to them. They came along and bawled me out, but he never spoke to them at all. Did you see this attack on Mr. Blackmore? No, sir. However, after I'd driven on through the signal, I, I glanced in the mirror and saw this Hudson with those men in it. I saw it stop, and a fellow got out and started to walk back. Did you see him strike the deceased? No, sir. Would you be able to identify this man if you saw him again? 
No, sir, I, I'm afraid I wouldn't. You wouldn't know the man you had the argument with? Well, I, I might, but I'm not sure. Did you get the license number of the other car? No, sir, I didn't. That's all, Mr. Kearns. Thank you. The jury may prepare their verdict. A few days later, Chief of Detectives James Bean sends for Lieutenant Condaffer and his partner, Jerry Hickey. Good on, boys. Thanks, Chief. Morning, Captain. What's been done about that Blackmore case? Plenty, but not by us. Just what do you mean by that? Well, in the first place, we got the license number of the Hudson from one of the witnesses as A12177. Yeah, and it turned out to be a Chevy coat. That's right. Meantime, we checked with another witness and found that it should have been A18177, which leaves us just as bad off as before. Why so? Well, you see, that car is registered to a bird named Court. Is it our Court? It's an old fellow. He's got two boys. Both of them have records as long as your arm. Petty theft, suspicion of robbery, and all that sort of thing. They run around with a bunch of would-be prize fighters. Unless we can get a case built up against either one of them, we haven't got a chance. Have you talked to anybody over at the DA's office? Yeah. We asked for complaints against court and suspicion of murder. We figured we could get something out of him about who was present at the killing. We asked that if he was picked up, that he be held without bail. And he was picked up. The first we knew about it was that he was scheduled for trial this morning. This morning? Yep, this morning. And you weren't notified? Oh, yes. Just in time to get there while the first witness is being questioned. Yeah, there was a whole parade of them. Dennison asked every one of them the same thing. Did you see this man on the morning of October 27th? I never saw him before in my life. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kearns, is this the man who drove that Hudson automobile that morning? Well, I'm not sure. You see, it was sort of foggy that morning. <laughs> Mr. Edwards, is this the man you saw in that automobile the morning that you were crossing Grand at Jefferson? Uh, no, sir. No, I, I don't think so. No, I, I don't believe he's the one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Britton, can you identify this man as the driver of the car that stopped near Christie Blackmore on the morning of October 27th? I, I, I don't believe I can. <laughs> time, Court sat there, laughing out loud. The only thing I can figure is that somebody got to those witnesses before we did. Intimidation, you mean? Exactly. Well, what do you suggest? Well, I've got an idea. Maybe a screwy one, but then again, you can never tell. It might work. Well, what is it? We might try it. You remember Blackmore's brother? Yes. Well, let's get hold of it. Get him to go to one of the newspapers and see if one of those sob sisters will run this story as their own idea. Maybe we can get some reactions from other witnesses that we don't know about now. Well, it's worth trying, anyhow. Get in touch with him and let's see what happens. All right. Well, boys, there's a story in the record. Yeah, let me see it. Wanted witnesses. And how? And so the brother started a personal investigation. Today he gave his report. I went to the district attorney's office, but they told me they couldn't open the case without more evidence. Yeah, we could have told him that. Mm-hmm. Stick around. We get in on this someplace. Here we are. I went to Jimmy Bean. Well, he told me the police were not through with this case, but that they couldn't do anything without further evidence. More witnesses. I hope we get them. Oh, wait a minute. Here's the important part. And that's why I'm coming to you. There are a number of people who saw my brother knocked down and who could help us identify the man who struck him. Yes, they would. Also identify the car and those other men in it. I feel sure that if these people knew how the case ended, that if they knew the guilty person was going scot-free, they'd come forward and help me bring him to justice. That ought to get them. Hmm. I should think so. Captain Bean, there's a man here who says he has some information about the Blackmore case. Send him in. Yes, sir. Maybe this is our first part. Right in here, please. Uh, you wanted to see me? Yes, sir. My name's George. I saw a story in the record last night about the Blackmore case. I thought Matt might be able to help. I certainly hope so, Mr. George. Well, this is Lieutenant Contifer. All right. And his partner, Jerry Hicks, uh, Hickey. Uh, they're working on the case. How do you do? Uh, now, Mr. George, uh, just what do you know about this case? Well, uh, among other things, I can identify...
identify the men who did the killing. At least I'm pretty sure I can. Oh, how's that? Well, on the morning that Blackmore was killed, I happened to be waiting for a streetcar at the same place. I saw the Hudson drive up, and well, here's a piece of paper that I wrote the license number on. Ah. A 18177. Well, that's it. All right. I was about ten feet away from Blackmore when this car drove up. Three men got out, and one was a tall man, and the other two were shorter. One was sort of blonde, and the other was a very dark man. These are the short guys? Yes. One of the men walked up to Blackmore and struck him in the face. That sort of turned him around and seemed to stun him. Then the first man said, take him, Turk. And the other short fellow hit him two or three times as he fell. And the tall fellow also struck him. Well, what were you doing all this time? Well, I was just standing there. It all happened so fast I couldn't do anything. What did you do after the men left? Well, as soon as Blackmore fell, the men ran back to their car and jumped in. And that's when I got the license number. I ran to Blackmore and picked him up. Or another fellow helped me. We put him on the sidewalk. Then I ran across to the drugstore and asked them to come over and see if there was anything that they could do. Uh, did they? No, they said that they weren't allowed to. They told me to go to the hospital. Yeah, there's one right close to there, isn't there, Hickey? Yeah, just a couple of doors down the street. Well, I went down there, and about that time an ambulance got there. Somebody else must have phoned for it. Mm-hmm. Did you get anyone else's name while you were there? Well, I gave my name to several people, and I, I took down the names of two people that were there. One was a woman and a fellow named uh, McDonald. Hmm. I've already checked the woman. She says she couldn't identify the man. Well, she could if she wanted to. She's just afraid. I see. And you can identify them. Oh, I'll say I can. I can identify one of them by his raspy voice, if nothing else. Did you say one of the witnesses was named McDonald? Yes, he works in a car rental agency on Western near Sunset Boulevard. That's fine. Come on, Jerry. Let's pay a little call on Mr. McDonald. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mr. George. Your help has been invaluable. Well, when you get him, call me. I'll identify him. I'm looking for Mr. McDonald. Hey, McDonald. What can I do for you? Heaven police headquarters, McDonald. We'd like to ask you a few questions about the Blackmore case. Not so loud. Huh? Come over here. How did you get my name? A fellow named George gave it to us. What's the matter with you? What are you looking for? Listen, if those birds see me talking to you, they'll give me a dose of what Blackmore got. I've got a wife and kid, you see, and I don't want to get mixed up in this. Now, don't worry. We're not going to make trouble for you. We just want the man who killed Blackmore. Look, there's a place right up the street here. It's a place like this. As a matter of fact, the same guy owns it. I was in there the day Blackmore died. Three fellas came and, uh, and started talking to this fella. One of them... Okay. Let me take your package, will you? What's the matter with Izzy's Hudson? Hey, the cops are looking for it. We was driving it this morning. We had a bit of guy up. Yeah, what's the beef now? Hey, he shut his mouth off. We let him have it. You're going to get in a jam beating people up like that? Yeah, sure, will you? Well, how about the package? Mm, okay, take it. But you got to get me a set of tires for it. I'll take care of that. I didn't see him when he came back, and I don't know what happened. But next time I saw the package, it had a new set of tires on it. In about uh, two or three days after that, I, uh, it was three days, I was over there again. And this bird comes in, the blue hat suddenly says... Uh, give me five bucks, Sam, for, for some flowers. Flowers for who? The toy kicked off this morning. We're seeing any flowers. Uh, wasn't he with you the other morning when you kicked that guy around? Yeah, can you beat that? The both of them die on the same day. Uh, Turk was punched drunk anyway. Yeah, 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 five bucks. I still think it's a waste of money. What do you care? You got a set of tires for that pack. It's awful cheap. Yeah, that hot stuff's going to get me in stores someday. Well, you're always singing the blues, ain't you, Sam? So long, you cooker. I'll see you later. Acting on information received from the thoroughly frightened witness, Tom Dapper and Hickey take the operator of the rental agency to headquarters for questioning. Now, look here, Sam. We've got enough information about the men who killed Blackmore to think that maybe you're in with them. I had nothing to do with it, I tell you. I didn't know nobody had killed nobody. Ah, uh, don't hand us that, Sam. We happen to know that you have a new set of tires on your package. If for nothing else, we can hold you on a hot tire charge. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what I know about it. It's like you say, this bird comes into my agency one morning and, and tells me he's beat a guy up. I don't ask him no questions. It's none of my business, see? So he wants to borrow my car, so I lend it to him. 
When he brings it back, the tires is on it. That's all I know. Oh, no, it's not. You know who that man was, and you know who was with him that morning. No, I can't tell you that. What's the matter with you, Sam? You're not scared, are you? I can't tell you their name. You tired of operating that rental agency, Sam? What do you mean? I'll turn you in the commission, have your license revoked, unless you come clean. No, no, sir, don't do that. This business is all I've got. So how would I make a living? The same way I suspect you're making it now. All right, all right. Come on, come on. Open up. Uh, uh, if I tell you, will you keep me out of this? Sure. Why not? All right. The fellow that hit Blackmore first was Dennis Murphy. We call him K.O. Kelly. He's done it. Who was with him? The Turk and Izzy Court and another guy. I don't know his name. Don't hand us that story. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know his name. Okay, Sam. Okay. We'll find out if you're lying to us. And if you are... Broadcast 204. Be on the lookout for three men driving a blue Hudson sedan with a red stripe around the body. Number one described as Armenian, five feet five inches, weight about 150 pounds. Number two described as American, five feet six or seven inches, about 150 pounds. Number three is about 24 or 25 years. It also weighs 150 pounds, five feet eight or nine inches. These men are wanted for murder. That's all. Good. That description of those monkeys wanted by L.A.? Yeah, all three of them. Must be pretty tough babies beating the guy up like they did. There's quite a bunch of thugs like that around town now. Hey, all quiet the little town of Glendale, though. Oh, yeah? Take a look up ahead there. Three birds stepped in the car. Yeah, needs looking into. Take it easy. Looks like they're getting ready to blow. Hey, you, come on over here. Ah, don't make it yourself, brother! The Mary Chase the gift. Hey, did you hear that voice? So what? Well, part of the description given by witnesses in that black box is that's a raspy voice. Well, in that case, we'll put on a burst of speed and overhaul them. Pull up alongside of you, Cam. Gentlemen, oh, I hate funny coppers. Not half as much as I hate punk crooks. Say, hey, do you look at this? A thirty-eight S and W. My, my, carrying concealed weapons too. Resisting arrest and stealing auto accessories. Let's put them away. Hey, Sarge. Let me see the make seat on those monkeys the Glendale boys brought in last night. Oh, pretty tough customers, if you ask me. Uh, is it our court, Sam Schwartz? Dennis Murphy. Court, court, Murphy. Hey, what does this guy Murphy look like? Oh, he's a little sort of guy, about 5'6". Weighs about 150, maybe. Hmm, let's take a look at his record. Uh, suspicion of a robbery, 1922... Burglary 23, robbery 23, robbery 24, burglary 25. <laughs> the leader of the church choir, eh? Hmm. He's hard enough, all right. They got a release order on him. What? Yeah, I got a warrant for him. I want to see him, too. Okay. Now, right back here. Right in there, Frank. Right. Hey, Kelly, come here. There's nobody in here but in every chili. Oh, yeah? Well, you'll do. Come here. Listen, Chopper, I ain't talking, see? Oh, I asked you to talk. Well, then, what's the idea, but Just you... wanted to get a good look at you, that's all. You ain't never seen me before. Hmm, I think maybe you're right at that. But I'm going to be seeing you for some time now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Let him out, Sergeant. Okay. Come on out, tough guy. Yeah, uh, but nothing. Hmm. You don't look like you could kill a guy. What's your beef, Trapper? What's the idea of springing me? Springing you? Who said I was springing you? Well, the thing was... Oh, the... I see. You're wondering about your newfound freedom. Well, I can explain that. Yeah, well, uh, strip me the lowdown on it. Well, it's very simple. 
You're not free. Oh, wait. I ain't free. No, no. We're just going to take a little ride. You see, I got me a new car. Yeah, well, where to? Down to the central jail. What for? For safekeeping till you tried for murder. Murder? You heard me. I'm arresting you for the murder of Chrissy Blackmore. Chrissy Blackmore? You can't fool the millions of motorists in 45 nations of the world who swear allegiance to Sinclair Motor Oil, nor the 52 railway systems, 150 major airlines, airports, and airplane manufacturers, and the great fleets of ocean-going vessels which have given the phrase Sinclair Eyes for Safety worldwide significance. They know the all-weather qualities of Sinclair Motor Oil. Sinclair Motor Oils maintain the same high lubricating values regardless of temperature. It is a fact that if you were to drive from the torrid zone to the Arctic, you wouldn't need to change oil if you were using Sinclair. The reason is as simple as it's important. Sinclair Motor Oils are subjected to the patented Sinclair process which makes them heat and cold proof and completely removes petroleum jelly and wax, the two elements found in almost every oil you buy. If you want a lubricant that will flow as smoothly on cool mornings and evenings as in the heat of the day, at the same time providing the moving parts of your motor with the resilient cushion it must have, why then have the crankcase drained of the weary and sluggish oil you may have been using and have it refilled with Sinclair Opaline, a smoother, tougher lubricant that comes to you in sealed, tamper-proof cans at only 25 cents a quart. When you drive into your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow morning for your supply of police car performance, Rio Grande cracked gasoline, Sinclairize for safety with all-weather Sinclair motor oil. Again, we are privileged to hear Chief Davis. K.O. Kelly, to use one of his many aliases, was lodged in the central jail, charged with the crime of murder. He was duly arraigned and brought to trial in Superior Court. Isidore Court, again using an alias, turned state's evidence, and on September 22, 1926, Kelly was allowed to plead guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to serve from one to ten years in the state penitentiary. Thus, in a small measure, he was made to pay for his brutal and unprovoked attack upon a defenseless man. Thank you, Chief Davis. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 204 regarding a fight at Jefferson and Grand. Suspect in this case has been sentenced to prison. That's all. Rolls and quits. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande.